here to speak to us about dark energy in the runaway universe on this election night, please join me in welcoming Professor Alex Filipenko. Well, thank you so much, Dietrich, for that wonderful introduction. And I thank all of you here for being here this evening. I was afraid that when I was scheduled for November 2nd, which was pretty much the only night I could come this semester, I was afraid that you would all be at home watching the election returns, right? No, you're not. Well, that's, that's amazing. Gee whiz, a nearly full house on election night. Of course, everyone has their little iPhones uh, on silence mode, but you're going to still be watching the, the exit polls and stuff. That's okay, I understand. Um, let me know what's happening. Anyway, <laughs> so it is a, a great pleasure to be here uh, this evening and to visit Portland again. I gave a talk at Reed College some years ago, and Portland actually holds a special place in my heart because I flew up here in 1979 in February from Santa Barbara where I was an undergraduate. I came up here to witness the February 26, 1979 total eclipse of the sun. We went just east of the ridge of the Cascade Mountains and it was clear for about 10 minutes right during totality. Oh man, was the adrenaline flowing. It was fantastic, okay. It was my first eclipse, I became hooked, and now I've seen 11 total solar eclipses. And you should be aware that on August 21st, 2017, there will be a total solar eclipse that actually passes through Oregon, I believe in the southern part of the state. So if you're in the state and you don't make it to the path of totality and I find out about it, I'm going to be really upset at you, okay? <laughs> Gotta go. It's just a, a life-changing experience. And I had my first one here in Oregon after a short flight from Santa Barbara. Anyway, it is a great pleasure to be here. Now, my talk this evening, of course, is about astronomy, but more specifically, it's about cosmology. Cosmology is that subset of astronomy that deals with the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole. So we're interested in some of the grandest questions imaginable. How large is the uni universe? Is it infinite or does it somehow wrap around itself? Does it have a spherical shape or a horse's saddle? Is it infinitely old or of a finite age? Look at this, a big time story. When did the universe begin? You see that a big time story. Cover story of Time Magazine. The age of the universe. In fact, a crowning achievement of the past couple of decades is that we've figured out that the universe is 13.7 plus or minus about 0.1 or 0.2 billion years old. Very old indeed, but not infinitely old, okay? An amazing achievement. What will become of the universe far in the future? Many of you know that the universe is currently expanding. That'll be the subject of my talk this evening. But will it expand forever? becoming ever colder, darker, more dilute? Or will it someday collapse in on itself, becoming hot, compressed, dense? What will be the fate of the universe? And again, another big time story, how the universe will end. Now this was a story written about our group's work, which I'll report on tonight. It was written in 2001. We thought at the time we knew how the universe would end. Now, nine years later, we understand more, and we've decided that we don't really know how it will end. But I will give you the possibilities tonight as well as the most likely scenario. Cosmologists are also interested in the basic fundamental building blocks of the universe. Those are the galaxies. Now we live in a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. If we could see it from the outside, it would look something like this. A gigantic structure of several hundred billion stars gravitationally bound together into a fantastic spiral. It spans something like 100,000 light years. So even a radio signal traveling at the speed of light would take 100,000 years to cross it. You could send a message to an alien friend, hey, let's go to the lecture series, okay? And 
They would get the message 100,000 years later and say, sure, let's go tonight. Well, by the time you receive that reply, 200,000 years will have gone by, and at least the current incarnation of this lecture series will have long ended. That's hardly a stimulating conversation, but I'm sorry, that's the way the universe is built. It's not my fault, I'm just the messenger, okay? But it consists of these gigantic galaxies, and it's not just that there's a few of them. They're all over the place. Here's one of my favorite photographs from the famous Hubble Space Telescope. It's part of what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The telescope stared at one small but representative patch of the sky for nearly two weeks, gathering light, seeing ever fainter structures. Now this is a small region of the sky. Imagine a grain of sand or a small pebble held at arm's length. Imagine how small that looks. That's roughly the fraction of the sky covered in this photograph. Yet here in this photograph, there's something like 3,000 galaxies. We could count them. One, two, three, four, five. I could use up my whole hour counting galaxies. That wouldn't be too interesting for you, but believe me, it's a pretty cushy job. They pay us to sit around and count galaxies. Anyway, very important work, okay? Extrapolating over the whole sky, and assuming this is a representative picture, and of course we can test that assumption by taking several of these things in different parts of the sky, and it is representative, but extrapolating over the whole sky, we now know that within the realm of today's greatest telescopes, there's something like 100 billion galaxies each containing billions or even hundreds of billions of stars. And that's just in the parts of the universe that we can see. We now have good reasons to think that the universe extends far, far beyond just those parts that we can see. And everywhere it's filled with these galaxies, the fundamental building blocks of the universe. How did they form? How did they evolve with time? These two are among the central questions of cosmology. So you can see it's just a fantastic field which intelligent creatures can and do study. And some of the most amazing conclusions about our origins, our fundamental origins, come from studies in this field, cosmology. Now before I move on, let me point out that among the general public, you, you know, you're excluded because this lecture series has been going on for a while, many years, and many of you I know are regulars, so you've gone to many learned presentations. You're not representative. But among the representative general public, there's considerable confusion between cosmology, the study of the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole, and cosmetology, the study of hairdos and facials. <laughs> they, I admit, sound quite similar. They're even spelled in a similar way, but interestingly, cosmetology is cosmology with an extra ET, like the extraterrestrial. I don't know of the cosmic significance of that, but write them down. Cosmetology differs from cosmology by an ET. Anyway, um, obviously they're really quite different, as are astrology and astronomy, okay? But to give you an example of this confusion, Here's a copy of an ad that a colleague of mine placed in my mailbox some months ago. Make cosmology your career. <laughs> Training and supervision in hairstyling, blow drying, permanent waves. You guys laugh, but these are all very important topics, okay? <laughs> Coloring and frosting, scalp treatments, body and skin care, style cuts, basic cuts. For further information and interviews, call that number. Now, classes started last month, I mean last March, this is an old ad, but they'll presumably be offering it at your local colleges and universities in the upcoming winter or spring quarters or semesters. So if you want to do as I and many of my colleagues have done and get to the cutting edge of this field, <laughs> sorry, my students have to put up with me every other day. You guys just once or twice, okay? But if you want to get to the cutting edge, you need to take a course like this. Get up to speed. Now, obviously, these guys need a course not only on what their own subject area is, but they need a course in spelling and proofreading because in addition to foother here, you see hair lying. See that? Hair lying and coloring 
Well, that's the British spelling, and my own thesis advisor was British, so I'll, I'll allow that one. These guys don't even know their own field. Actually, you know, they're not really that different. I sometimes say that the only real difference between my UC Berkeley course on cosmology and a course on cosmetology is that I don't give makeup exams. Uh, anyway, uh, this is really very, very, very bad. My father-in-law thought up that one. Yes, the pun is a very refined form of humor, you see, so... Uh, <laughs> All right, well, let's dive into it. We go back to around 1917, where an astronomer in Arizona, Vesto Slipher, noticed a very interesting thing. He looked at galaxies, these giant collections of stars, and specifically, he passed their light through a prism, or another contraption, a grating, for example, that can disperse, spread the light out into a rainbow, a spectrum, consisting of the component colors of this incoming light, the sunlight or the starlight or the galaxy light, okay? And spectroscopy, the study of spectra, can tell you a lot of interesting things about stars and galaxies, like the chemical composition of the gases. You get that from these various absorption lines, which are caused by gases that are relatively cool in the outer parts of stars. And you can determine the temperature of stars, and you can determine the pressure of the gases, and all sorts of other interesting things. And you can determine whether the object is moving toward you or away from you. If it's moving toward you, the pattern of lines is shifted toward bluer wavelengths, shorter wavelengths. And if it's moving away from you, it's shifted toward longer or redder wavelengths. And this is a little bit analogous to the audible Doppler effect that all of you have heard. When a siren is coming toward you, the pitch sounds high relative to when it's stationary because the waves get sort of scrunched together. And when it's moving away from you, the pitch sounds low because they're spread apart. So if the siren goes past you, like that, you can clearly hear this change in pitch. Now, if you hear a siren that's going, eeyah, 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 it doesn't mean the driver is drunk and can't make up his mind which way to go. It, mean, it just means that the pitch isn't constant. But if you listen carefully, you can hear generally high-pitched eeyahs coming down to low-pitched eeyahs as it passes you. Well, light does a similar sort of thing. Indeed, you can detect the wobble of stars in response to the motion of exoplanets by looking carefully at the spectrum. Uh, but you can also detect the motion of galaxies by looking at their spectra. And Slipher noticed that most galaxies have redshifted spectra. A few, like the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest big neighbor, have blue-shifted spectra, implying that it's coming toward us. But most galaxies are moving away from us. However, Slipher could discern no obvious pattern to these motions. For that, we needed Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named. He was able to determine distances of a bunch of these galaxies whose speeds Slipher had measured. And he noticed a very interesting correlation. Yes, indeed, most galaxies are moving away from us. But in fact, the nearby galaxies are moving away from us more slowly than the distant galaxies. So basically, they're all moving away, but at a given time, right now, you see nearby galaxies as they are right now, the ones that are far farther away and fainter looking are moving faster than the ones that are nearby. Now, this alone does not indicate an accelerating expansion. I'll get to that later. But it was an interesting correlation. And if you look at things from our perspective, here's the Milky Way galaxy, okay? Ah, laser, yeah, there we go. And here are the other galaxies, and they're all moving away. And right now, the more distant ones are moving faster than the nearby ones. So it sort of leads naturally to this idea of an expanding universe. But before I move on, I should pause, because there's something kind of puzzling about this diagram as I've drawn it. What's puzzling about it? Yeah, we're in the center. Why should that be? Why are, why are we in the middle? Do the other galaxies not like us? Is it something we said or do we smell? Or maybe these other galaxies are lactose intolerant. Get it? Milky Way galaxy, lactose intolerant, yeah. 
A 12-year-old kid came up with that one in a public talk that I gave, and I asked his permission to use that joke in the future, but I forgot to write down his name, so I can't give credit. But anyway, when I talk about cosmology at my home institution, UC Berkeley or Cal, I say, are we from Stanford or something? Is that why the other galaxies don't like us? You know, big time rivalry. I know, I hear, I hear some hisses there. Stanford is a fine, fine institution. I have great respect for it. It's just not quite as fine as Cal. But anyway, um, so no, we don't think we're in any special place. We think that no matter which galaxy we happen to be in, we would see the others moving away from us. And it's very easy to come up with simple models of homogeneously expanding universes that have this property. All galaxies think they're at the center. Okay, and here's one such analogy, uh, analogy an expanding loaf of raisin bread. So the dough is filled uniformly with yeast, and you let it bake for an hour, and let's say it doubles in size in one hour. So the bread, the dough expands. By the way, the raisins, the galaxies, don't expand. In the case of the galaxies, they're held together by gravity sufficiently strongly that they overcome the tendency of space to expand. And by the way, we know that the Hubble relationship is an actual expansion of space, not a motion of galaxies through a pre-existing space. So it's not, strictly speaking, the Doppler effect. Rather, it's an expansion of space and the photons within it. I'll talk about that more later, if you wish, later on. Anyway, I'm not trying to fool you here. I've drawn a finite universe, but the universe either is infinite or wraps around itself. So I'm not trying to trick you with the edges here. It was just hard to draw an infinite universe on a finite sheet of paper. But you can see that from the perspective of this raisin, all the others move away. But the same could be said from the perspective of this raisin. They call each other up. They say that we're each the center. They have a big war about it. Neither one of them is the unique center. There may be a unique center, but it's not in any physically accessible dimension. Moreover, notice that this raisin started out from that one with a distance of five centimeters. After an hour, it's at a distance of 10 centimeters. By advanced mathematics, 10 minus five is five centimeters. The average recession speed was five centimeters per hour. This one started out 10 centimeters away, okay? After an hour, it reaches 20 centimeters, 20 minus 10 is 10, for an average speed of 10 centimeters per hour. Twice the distance, twice the speed. This is a property of a uniformly expanding universe. Every bit of dough expands. So the more the dough there is between two galaxies to begin with, the greater will be the rate of recession of those two galaxies away from one another. In fact, if you want to do this at home, you can easily make a one-dimensional universe with ping pong balls, those are the galaxies, and a rubber band or a rubber hose, that's the space between them. And as I stretch, as I stretch this universe, from the perspective of the orange ping pong ball, all the others move away with a speed that's proportional to their distance. But the same can be said for any other ping pong ball. It sees the others move away with a speed that's proportional to its distance. And again, take an infinite rubber band or one that wraps around itself. The edges are irrelevant. I'm not trying to trick you. So the Hubble relationship seems to imply that we live in a homogeneously expanding universe and that our galaxy is not the preferred one. And in fact, there are other tests of that hypothesis that validate the idea that we're not in any special galaxy. Well, with today's great telescopes like the Hubble, we have measured the current expansion rate of the universe. It's just some number. I won't bore you with the exact number. And you might think that's all there is to know. With what speed is the universe expanding? But that's not all there is to know. And this goes all the way back to Newton. Newton said, gravity pulls. You toss an apple up, and the mutual gravitational attraction between the Earth and the apple slows it down. Okay? Can't give a talk about gravity without using the proverbial Newtonian apple, even if it does happen to be a fake apple. Anyway, if I throw it faster, it goes up higher, okay? But it still comes down. Now, I could, had I eaten my Wheaties this morning, in principle throw it so fast, and ignoring the ceiling here, technical difficulty, okay? I could throw it so fast that it would never stop and come back down to the ground. It would achieve an escape speed, all right? It would continue to slow down forever, but its speed would asymptotically approach some non-zero 
value, okay? And it would never come to a stop and certainly never would come back down. So if I have, in a sense, a large amount of mass pulling on matter compared to its initial energy, then the matter eventually comes back down. If I don't have a lot of mass pulling on the matter for a given initial speed, then that matter can recede away from the Earth forever. So too with the universe. If the density of the universe is sufficiently high, that is the mass per unit volume, then all these galaxies pulling on all other galaxies will slow down the expansion of the universe, eventually bringing it to a halt, and then there will be a collapse. So eventually then, all the galaxies on this coordinate grid will collapse in on each other in what we can call the big crunch, okay? So you start with a big bang for whatever reason, and then you get a big crunch. Now you could say you start with a big bang and you end with a gnab gib, which is big bang backwards, right? Big bang, gnab gib. So that would be a dense universe. That's one possible fate. But suppose the density of the universe is low. Suppose the amount of matter per unit volume is insufficient to stop completely the expansion. It may slow it down. You can't cut off the effects of gravity so far as we can tell. But suppose the density is insufficient to bring the universe to a halt. In that case, the universe would expand forever, admittedly progressively more slowly, but never coming to a halt. That would be a universe with a very different fate from the Gnab Gib. It would be a universe that continues to become ever more dilute, ever colder, ever darker with time. A very different fate. And I said that the ultimate fate of the universe is one of the central questions of cosmology, so we'd like to know. And there's a way we can know in principle. After all, if I measure the apple's motion and I see that it's slowing down quickly with time, then I can push through the equations and figure out that someday it'll stop and reverse its motion. On the other hand, if I find that the apple isn't slowing down very much with time, then it might well continue going away from the Earth forever. So in principle, if I look back into the past history of the universe, the rate at which the expansion has been slowing down with time, I can in principle predict the fate. If the universe has been slowing down quickly, it'll someday stop and recollapse. If it hasn't been slowing down very much, it'll expand forever. So an examination of the past history can tell us the fate, at least if the only thing operating is normal gravity. Now you might say, okay, we know the current expansion rate of the universe, but how might we determine what it used to be? How can we actually make this comparison of the expansion rate long ago with what it is now? Anyone want to venture a guess? Look, look far away, someone said. Right, why does that help you? farther away and bar back in time. What's your name? I actually can't see you because of these lights, but what's your name? Scott. Scott says, basically, light doesn't travel at an infinite speed. Light travels at a finite speed. It travels, in fact, about a foot per nanosecond, a foot per billionth of a second. So, in fact, if I could see Scott, I would be seeing him not as he is now, but as he was perhaps 50 or 60 billionths of a second ago. Okay? not as he is now. He may not even exist anymore. <laughs> oh, he does. Okay, good for me. I had someone who kn knew the answer. Actually, several of you did. Even better for him. He's still on this good earth. You see the sun as it was a little over eight minutes ago because it takes eight and one-third minutes for the light to traverse 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. Even the nearest representative stars that you see in the sky are, are typically some tens of light years away. And many of the stars you see are hundreds or even, in a few cases, thousands of light years away. So you're seeing them as they were tens, hundreds, or thousands of years ago. You're looking back in time. That's a wonderful aspect of light. It's non-infinite speed. If it were infinite, you'd see the whole universe as it is now. But it's not infinite. So if we look at galaxies that are, say, a billion light years away and four billion light years away, and maybe that little smudge there is nine billion light years away, you're seeing them as they were one, four, nine billion years ago. And encoded in that light 
is information about the expansion rate of the universe one, four, nine billion years ago. And you can compare those expansion rates with the value we measure now. You have a movie of the history of the universe. That's what the finite speed of light gives you. You look back in time by looking at progressively greater distances. So what we need to do is figure out the distances of the, these galaxies so that we know how far back in time we're looking. Well, how do you get distances of galaxies? For nearby galaxies, it's not so, it's not so hard, okay? Uh, let's say you find a star here in a nearby galaxy, and let's call it Dietrich, okay? Um, and you say that that star is just like Betelgeuse, a star in the constellation Orion, the left shoulder, okay? There's the head, there's the left shoulder, right shoulder, feet, the belt, and the sword. And Betelgeuse is a relatively nearby star. We know its distance. We know how bright it appears to be. We can figure out the power, the luminosity, the oomph of, uh, of, of Betelgeuse. If we then compare that with star Dietrich down here, look at how bright it appears to be, and if we know it's the same kind of star, and you have to examine it carefully to persuade yourself of this, then you can figure out how far away it is by comparing how bright it appears to be with the known power. And you're effectively using the inverse square law. You're looking at uh, the apparent brightness of stars and comparing them with the true power, thus determining the distance of this star. If you do that for a bunch of stars in the same galaxy and you get the same distance, then you have some confidence that you're getting the correct result. Now, familiar example. You determine the distance of an oncoming car at night by looking at how bright the headlights appear to be and you've calibrated how bright the headlights are of a car that's nearby of known distance. So you have your nearby car of known distance, and then you have your distant one whose headlights you evaluate, and you judge the distance of an oncoming car that way, almost intuitively, almost instinctively. In fact, I would say, if you're not very good at doing this quickly, then you shouldn't be driving at night, okay? An independent check, by the way, is provided when your brain evaluates the angular separation between those headlights. That's a, another thing that correlates with distance. But anyway, cars, stars, works the same way. We can determine the distances of galaxies, at least in nearby cases. However, suppose you're looking at a galaxy here, let's call that one Terry, and you say, well, that one's you know, maybe billions of light years away, but how can you tell? I mean, I don't see any individual stars there. They merge together, and they are too faint to be seen individually. So maybe this technique only works for nearby galaxies where you see individual stars. So we're hosed. Or are we? Is there a type of star that is visible at distances of billions of light years? Anyone? You're all in the darkness there to me, so. A supernova, what's a supernova? An exploding star, that's right. Some stars, a small minority of stars, end their lives not with a whimper, as our sun will do, but with a titanic, colossal explosion. Here's an example of one that exploded. In fact, we studied this one in some detail in 1987. This is supernova 1987A. And these titanic explosions can become millions, or in some cases, even billions of times as powerful as the sun. So here's one going off. I sped up the process a little bit. It takes a few weeks to brighten and some months to fade. But here it is at its peak. That's a single star that blew up, and it rivals the brightness of the central billion stars in this galaxy. It's a billion solar luminosities. If our sun were to do this, which it won't, okay, sunblock of 50 just wouldn't cut it, all right? You'd need sunblock or supernova block of a few billion to protect yourself. But don't worry, be happy, the sun isn't gonna blow up. Nevertheless, its luminosity, its power is gradually rising and within about a billion or so years, the oceans will have evaporated away. So, in fact, we have to move out of here long before our sun turns into a red giant, for those of you who know what that is. Anyway, if you find some exploding stars in galaxies of known distance, so here's a star that has a, I'm sorry, here's a galaxy that has a star like Terry or Dietrich, and you know it's 
true power and you measure the apparent brightness and you determine the distance of that galaxy. So let's say you now know the distance of this galaxy and you find a supernova that goes off in it in a galaxy of known distance and you measure its apparent brightness. Well, that tells you the power, the oomph of that supernova. Okay, because you measure the apparent brightness and you know the distance through some other means, okay? So that allows you to calibrate that supernova. If you then find similar supernovae in tiny little smidgen smudges of galaxies, you can look at the apparent brightness of the supernova and thus judge its distance and the distance of the galaxy in which it's located. Now, you have to use a type of exploding star that's pretty standard. There are different ways in which stars can explode. They're not all the same, okay? So you have to find the, the standard light bulbs, the 100-watt light bulbs, okay? And you have to make sure you're not confusing 100-watt light bulbs with 72-watt light bulbs. But this is something we do. I mean, this is why research you know, takes years, decades to do, is that you have to deal with all these little, little gotchas and stuff. But in principle, you can do that. And you have to find quite a few nearby supernovae in nearby galaxies in order to evaluate whether they're standard or to figure out a way to read the label on the light bulb, the wattage. So we need to find a bunch of nearby supernovae in order to calibrate the headlight, so to speak. But stars explode in a typical galaxy so rarely, maybe two or three times per century, that they're hard to find. I mean, I could be a really cruel advisor and have each of my students looking through the eyepiece of a telescope at one and only one galaxy, always the same one, preferably at night. You see more stars and galaxies at night than during the day. Until he or she finds a supernova, then we let them graduate and move on to greener pastures. <laughs> Meanwhile, I will have had decades of slave labor out of this student. Well, of course, there are some crimes that are so egregious that even a tenured professor could and should get fired, and that would be one such crime, okay? Fortunately, there's power in numbers. Let's say for round numbers that there's one supernova per galaxy per century, just to make it simple, okay? Well, statistically, that's the same thing as one supernova per 100 galaxies per year. Each of those 100 galaxies will produce a supernova sometime in the next century. That means on average, one of them will do it each year. You just don't know which one. But if you're monitoring all of them, then each year one of them will produce a supernova and you'll be golden. You'll have a supernova to study each year. But we're greedy, we want to study several supernovae each year. So suppose you monitor a thousand galaxies frequently. You can't just monitor them once a year because then when you're not looking at them, maybe a supernova will go off. But suppose you monitor them frequently, you'll find 10 supernovae per year. And then that's, that's a number you can study, okay? Evaluate their properties. So I could have my students staring through the eyepiece of a telescope looking at thousands of galaxies each night. But that would be considered cruel and unusual punishment as well. Because, I mean, students need to sleep and study, and most importantly, party, okay? So I would be fired if I had my students doing that. Fortunately, with modern technology, there's a simpler and better technique. You just attach a CCD camera, like your digital camera, to the back end of a telescope, take photographs of lots and lots of galaxies, and look for arrows. Where you see an arrow, you see an exploding star. <laughs> it works every time, see? Once, twice, three times, four times, five times, by the process of rigorous mathematical induction, I conclude that this must work every time. Well, obviously it, it can't, right? I mean, if it were so simple to find exploding stars, we wouldn't give degrees for this kind of work. So it's a little bit more complicated, but not much more complicated. I have a robotic telescope at Lick Observatory, just a two-hour drive from the Berkeley campus, that my team has basically been operating for over a decade now. And it has software that's been written that makes it automatically point to over a thousand galaxies a night and take their picture. Over the course of a week, we monitor nearly nine or 10,000 galaxies. And then after the week is over, we start over again. We take mug shots of those same galaxies. My expert 
associate Wei Dong Li programmed the computer to do this. Moreover, it automatically compares the new pictures of galaxies with old pictures. Usually there's nothing new in the new picture. But occasionally there is. You see this arrow here, but actually we put that in with Adobe Photoshop later on. Here's the new thing, right? Here's the old picture of the galaxy. Here's some stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. They're much more nearby. Okay, here's a thing that appeared superposed on that galaxy. That's a supernova candidate. It may be a star in that galaxy that blew up. It's not necessarily a star. There are things that masquerade as supernovae, all right? For example, charged particles called cosmic rays could hit the CCD and sometimes look like a star. Or maybe this is an asteroid hurtling through space with Earth's name written on it, and it happened to be in the general direction of that galaxy at the moment we snapped the photo. So there are many things that these new events may be. Nevertheless, some of them are supernovae, and out of the 50 to 100 candidates that the computer finds each night out of, say, 12 or 13, 1,300 galaxies, I have a group of students, I mean, no, no, students, who with, their, who with their superb eye-brain combination evaluate the 50 to 100 candidates from each night and determine which ones are likely to be supernovae and hence worthy of follow-up observations. I'm very proud of my team. They've been doing a good job. This fellow here is really quite interesting looking. His hairstyle is, um, yes, interesting. I don't know if he's trying to get a date or what, but you have to remember, this is the UC Berkeley campus. So uh, he's now actually a grad student at Stanford, and that's okay with me. You know, he's, he's an engineer. He didn't go into astronomy, but he learned how to do research under my tutelage. So that's nice. Anyway, you can see that we've been doing very well over the past decade. We found our first supernova in 1997. That was hardly a world record. Moreover, you might say, this was a supernova of questionable integrity, given its name, 1997BS. Well, as I alluded to earlier, they are named in order of discovery in any given calendar year. So it goes A, B, C through Z, that takes her the first 26, then A, 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 B, A, C through A, Z, and then B, A, and so on. So I will leave it as a relatively uninteresting exercise for the listener to figure out what number in the sequence that happened to be. We then started really ramping up. We found many, many supernovae, setting several world records. We're proud of the fact that we found the first supernova of the new millennium. Regardless of your definition of the new millennium, we found the first one. Now, that's not astrophysically important, but we thought it was kind of cool anyway, okay? So we find a bunch of them. We could find more if we wanted, but we set aside part of our time with our telescope monitoring how they brighten and fade with time, because that tells us about the physics of the explosions, what's going on, whether they're standard, what the wattage is. And we also study the chemical composition of the ejecta. It turns out that stars and supernovae cook up heavy elements deep in their nuclear furnaces and then expel those elements. So the carbon in your cells, the oxygen that you breathe, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your red blood cells, and of course the gold, silver, platinum in your jewelry, all those things were cooked up in stars normal stars or exploding stars, and they were expelled into the cosmos largely by these exploding stars, making the elements available as raw material for the formation of new stars, planets, and ultimately life. So when Carl Sagan used to say so eloquently, we are made of star stuff or stardust, what he meant quite literally, though he didn't discover this by any means, uh, but what he meant quite literally is that the heavy elements in your bodies were synthesized, were cooked up in stars long, long ago. And, and this is why life is here. I mean, life is here for many other reasons, but cooking up the elements was a necessary step, a necessary ingredient in the eventual emergence of life. So we study a bunch of them, and by now we understand pretty well which kinds of supernovae are good for cosmology. For those who want to do a little bit more studying, they're called type 1a supernovae. You can look them up. Okay, I don't want to go into precisely what they are, but there are different ways in which stars can explode, and the best kind of explosion for cosmology is the type 1a supernova. So we now know how bright the headlight is. So now let's go and do some cosmology. So over 15 years ago, two teams formed 
to study, to find and study very distant type 1a supernova. The first one to form was the Supernova Cosmology Project led by Saul Perlmutter at Berkeley, and I was initially actually a member of that team. But a few years later, another team formed the High Redshift, High Z Supernova Search Team, led by Brian Schmidt of the Australian National University. And it consisted of many of my long-term buddies and stuff, and had a different culture than this team, which consisted largely of particle physicists who had turned to astrophysics, and it was just a, a different culture. So I felt more comfortable with this group, but I had done enough contributions to the first group such that my name ended up being on both papers that reported the discovery. So uh, that's why I have a large citation rate. Anyway, it was good to have two teams. They wanted to be first, and they wanted to be best. And this accelerated, if you'll pardon the pun, progress in the field, right? When you've got some competition, you can't just be slacking off. And if the competition is taking into account subtle little effects that you aren't taking into account, then you will look bad by comparison. So it was good to have two teams. It was good for the science. We weren't always duking it out. Here's Brian and here's Saul. We would frequently meet in Aspen. In fact, we just met this past summer in Aspen. This photograph was taken in Aspen many years ago. We would meet to discuss our ideas, how we're going about our science, and so on and so forth. Moreover, the answer we came up with was so bizarre that had there been only one team, no one would have taken us seriously. Anyway, both teams used large telescopes, primarily in the southern hemisphere, in Chile, to take wide-angle pictures of the sky. Not quite so wide-angle, this is just a PR shot. But by wide angle, I mean an angle that covers, say, the diameter of the full moon. And in a deep picture that's that wide, you see literally thousands of galaxies. Almost every smudge you see here is a galaxy. There are very few stars in our own galaxy in this photograph. You quickly run out of stars if you take deep enough pictures. You start, the sky starts becoming dominated by galaxies something that's not the case when you look with the naked eye, of course. So if you were to take 30 or 50 such pictures of different parts of the sky over the course of a couple of nights, you will effectively have the mugshot of something like 100,000 galaxies. If three weeks later you repeat the process, you take pictures of the same parts of the sky, some of those 100 galaxies, 100,000 galaxies, will have produced type 1a supernovae during those three weeks. And you can find them by digitally subtracting an old image from a new image. Here I just show part of such an image. But here's one taken three weeks earlier than that one. You digitally subtract that one from this one, and you get a bunch of noise. Any measurement process necessarily has some noise associated with it. But here, cleverly placed in the middle of the square, is something that looks like it might be real. All right, so you examine it further. And in fact, here's a Hubble picture taken a few weeks later that shows it once again. And in fact, you could tell from a series of pictures like this that it brightened and declined in a manner representative of type 1a supernovae. So it was a good candidate type 1a supernova. We were excited. The real way to tell us to take a spectrum. The spectrum gives you the fingerprint. It can tell you definitively whether it's a type 1a supernova and that's where my main role comes in as a member of the faculty of the University of California. I have access to the largest optical telescopes in the world, the twin 10-meter Keck telescopes on the Mauna Kea volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii, a volcano that the geologists at Cal and Caltech and elsewhere tell us is either extinct or highly dormant. Well, this highly dormant business worries us a little bit especially since Mauna Loa, just a few tens of miles away, does erupt every few decades, and Kilauea, at the southeastern end of the island, is one of the most volcanically active zones in the world, okay? So, you know, we're a little bit worried about this because among many international institutions, there's about a billion dollars worth of equipment on this highly dormant volcano. So if it blows up one of these days, those geologists will be fired, regardless of whether they have tenure. That would be an egregious crime, okay? But they tell us, don't worry, 
the hot spot has moved. Well, actually, it's not that the hot spot moves. The, the plate moves, and the hot spot remains uh, in about the same place. And in fact, there's a new island coming up off the coast of the big island. I think it's called Loki or something, but it won't surface for a few million years. Perhaps savvy real estate agents can already start selling land, OK? Anyway, I get the spectra of these faint things. Using the immense 10-meter diameter mirror, which is able to collect the light from these faint objects and spread them out into a rainbow, a spectrum, from which I can then analyze whether the light is or is not the signature of a type 1a supernova. And this telescope is a really great work of genius. It was invented by Jerry Nelson, who used to be at Berkeley at the time and now is at Santa Cruz. It consists of 36 segments, each of which is lightweight and relatively inexpensive to manufacture and they are controlled several times per second to continually have the proper shape of a single monolithic mirror at a fraction of the cost. And here's a former director of Keck, Fred Chaffee, showing you the size of a typical segment. It's 1.8 meters from corner to corner. I'll admit, he usually wasn't there when we were taking data. This is just a PR shot. The extra light gathering power provided by the pupil of the human eye is dwarfed by that provided by the glass. Nevertheless, it's kind of a cool photo. So when I got spectra that indicated that we had found good type 1a supernovae, well then I was a very happy camper, and now you see the real reason that we build observatories in Hawaii. I feel that Northern California waters, and probably the waters up here as well, are generally too cold for swimming without a wetsuit, and wetsuits are kind of a pain, so I don't go swimming in California, at least not in Northern California, but I like, I like the beach. Um, in fact, I'm going there this Thursday to continue our observations for this and other related projects. And I look forward to spending a couple of quality hours on the beach after having worked all night and slept for a few hours in the morning. But anyway, there's good scientific reasons, of course, for building telescopes in Hawaii, but it's nice that it's such a choice location. Anyway, let's get to the heart of the matter. Here's three of the supernovae we discovered. They're in these boxes, and blow-ups of them are shown down here, dutifully marked with an arrow, okay? And the basic point is that they're faint. They're really, really faint. Now, you might say, well, what's the big deal? They're in these scrawny, small, faint, pathetic-looking galaxies. The galaxies look like they're far away, so obviously the supernovae are far away as well and should look faint. Well, that's right. But the point is, is that they look fainter than we had any right to expect them to be. They're too faint. The, ex the implied distances are too great. Let me explain. Suppose you have the Big Bang, and let's say the universe were only one second old instead of 14 billion years. I can't illustrate 14 billion years very well. So it's one second old, and I measure the distance the apple reached from my hand after one second. It's some distance. But after all, it was slowing down due to the pull of, of gravity, due to the Earth's presence. If the Earth were less massive, the apple wouldn't slow down as much. And in one second, it would reach a greater distance, right? Now, I can't make the Earth less massive, but I can do the next best thing. I can throw it faster. And in one second, it gets to a greater distance. Same desired effect, slightly different physics. Now, suppose I remove the Earth whatsoever and I throw the apple, will it slow down at all in the absence of the sun and Jupiter and other forces? No, that's just Newton's first law of motion. With no forces acting upon an object, it continues going in a straight line with the same speed forever. So in one second, this apple would traverse an even bigger distance because it hasn't been slowing down, right? Well, that's the maximum you can possibly get using any sort of reasonable attractive gravity or even no gravity. The maximum distance you can reach is if there's no gravity, then there's no deceleration. But the measurements of the supernovae suggested a distance for the supernovae, the apple, that was greater than the distance it could reach, even if not slowing down at all. Whoa. Unless there's something weird going on and we had to you know, evaluate and remove all the possible subtle effects like 
if there's fog between you and the supernova or dust, it may make it look too dim, not because it's far away, but because of the, the dust and the fog, just like the setting sun looks dim because it's going through a lot of atmosphere. Anyway, we had to rule out all other explanations, and, and eventually they were all ruled out other than the distance interpretation. These guys looked too faint because they were at a greater distance than you might imagine, even in a non decelerating, that is, constantly expanding universe. So the obvious answer is that the universe's expansion has been doing what? Accelerating, speeding up. After all, if I attach a rocket to this apple, it can go zoop, and in one second, it traverses a greater distance than it would have had it been going at a constant speed. So if you accelerate something, it can get to that greater distance. Yowza. We were expecting to measure some amount of slowing down, some amount of deceleration that would tell us whether the universe will eventually do this or expand forever. In a sense, the sign that we found for the effect was wrong. Instead of slowing down, it was speeding up. And the headline that came out was, astronomers see a cosmic anti-gravity force at work. Now, we use this headline, anti-gravity, hesitantly because people, can, people ask us, you know, reporters, reporters ask us, can we attach this stuff, this anti-gravity stuff, whatever it is, to our cars and levitate over Portland traffic jams or San Francisco Bay Area traffic jams? And the, the answer is no. Based on our current understanding, this stuff is either a property of space that is not harnessable or there's so little of it per unit volume that effectively you can't harness it, you can't collect it. So we use anti-gravity in that sense sort of, sort of hesitantly. Nevertheless, it is a repulsive effect. You could call it a repugnant effect if you want. It makes things expand faster and faster and faster with time. By things, I actually more precisely mean it makes the space between clusters of galaxies expand faster and faster and faster. The clusters themselves are gravitationally bound, galaxies are gravitationally bound, solar systems are gravitationally bound, planets are gravitationally bound. None of them is expanding. But the space between clusters of galaxies is expanding faster and faster and faster with time. Now the first person on the high redshift team, the one with which I was primarily associated to make this discovery, was a young postdoctoral fellow, Adam Rees, who was working at Berkeley at the time under my direction. He had been charged to measure the brightnesses of supernovae in the data that we had accumulated for the, from the previous few years. He's now a very famous astrophysicist at Johns Hopkins University, and here he is from Time magazine, Adventures in Anti-Gravity. And the end of 97 was sort of the most amazing time in my career because he'd come to my office and he said, well, he came to my office once and he said, well, Alex, you know, here's the results of the measurements. And I could hardly believe it. I said, well, that, that's the wrong sign, right? These guys are too faint. These are too large a distance. This is an acceleration, as you yourself have deduced. And that's not the way the universe should be operating. Maybe you made a measurement error. So he went back and made the measurements again and he got the same answer. And other people on our team made the measurements independently and got the same answer. And it turns out, unbeknownst to us, Perlmutter's team was getting about the same answer as well. But they hadn't yet done all the checks and balances of other subtle effects that might be getting in the way. So they actually published their work six months after the high z team published theirs. So in a sense, we were first. But they had the result in their data, just not in as compelling a way. So it's fine to say that we were simultaneous. But Really, the high Z team was first. I had to say that because they often say they were first, and that's just not true. We were at best simultaneous, and really, we published first. And about that, there's absolutely no disagreement. You can look at the dates that the papers were submitted for publication and published, so take that. Anyway, um, <laughs> that was in February 98, where I actually was privileged to announce the results for our team at a meeting in LA. By December of 98, the editors of Science Magazine decided to proclaim this to be the single most discovery in all areas of science that year. And we were pleased by this, of course, this recognition, but we still weren't absolutely sure. We had published the result with the proper caveats. 
But the editors said, well, you know, the better part of a year has gone by and no one has found any obvious errors in your methods of observation, analysis, or really, frankly, even in your interpretation. There's no obvious error. So either you're right or you're wrong for some subtle reason that'll end up teaching us something interesting about the universe. And that's often how science works. You end up finding something unanticipated and maybe even your initial explanation was wrong, but the mere act of finding something then leads to new insights, new breakthroughs. So the caricature of Einstein here is surprised. It's not because he's blowing universes out of his pipe. You may not have known that, but that's where universes come from. They come from the pipes of famous theoretical physicists. Actually, that's not true. But we do think there may well be multiple universes. Serious physicists are seriously thinking about the possibility of multiple universes, but that's a different talk. In fact, probably uh, Brian Greene will mention this to some degree in his talk in February. But he's surprised more by the fact that the single universe is expanding faster and faster with time, something that's difficult to convey in a single still picture. He's doubly surprised because he has a sheaf of papers here where there's an equation. The Greek letter lambda equals 8 pi g, Newton's constant of gravitation, times the density of the vacuum. Now you might say, what the heck? You were taught on your mother's knee that the vacuum is zilch, zero, nothing. How can it have a non-zero energy or mass density? Seems crazy. What's this joker from Berserkly telling you guys? Well, first of all, again, I'm just the messenger. Einstein came up with the idea in 1917. Why? Because he and most people at the time thought that the universe is, is neither expanding nor collapsing. He thought it was static. There was no evidence at the time that the universe is expanding. There was also no evidence that the sky was falling, despite what it says in Chicken Little. Okay? So they assumed it was static. But Einstein knew that gravity pulls. By the way, they didn't quite yet understand the nature of galaxies, but it doesn't matter. The gist of the argument remains the same. Here's our Milky Way galaxy. Here's another galaxy. They attract each other with a force. Okay, let me just represent it with this one arrow here, but they're actually attracting each other. If this galaxy is to remain stationary, there has to be some oppositely directed force with an equal magnitude. So Einstein called this the cosmological constant. It acts in a direction opposite to that of gravity. It's exactly the same size as gravity. That's pretty weird. Why would it be that way? Even if you came up with some sort of a weird physical effect that's repulsive, why should it be tuned to be exactly the same amount as the thing that's pulling down? Right? If, if a force dominates, then it'll either go up or go down. But the forces have to be equal and opposite for it to remain stationary. That seemed weird. Moreover, there were no experiments in laboratories that suggested that there's any such repulsive effect. And it had the bizarre property of saying that the vacuum is not the purely empty, lifeless, boring stuff you were taught that it is, but rather it is filled with a type of energy that's repulsive. And that was just a, a repugnant idea. Now, 12 years later, Hubble discovered that the universe isn't static after all. It's expanding for whatever reason, the Big Bang. That's a different talk. We're still not sure exactly why the Big Bang occurred. But undeniably, it's expanding. If you start the apple going upward like that, it'll keep on going in the absence of other forces. Indeed, you need forces to slow it down, if anything. So once you get an, a, a universe to expand to begin with, you don't need any other weird effects to continue that expansion. Indeed, Einstein renounced this idea as having been, anecdotally, the biggest blunder of his career. Because had he not insisted on the presence of the cosmological constant, he would have predicted, as some of his theoretical colleagues did predict, that the universe is unlikely to be in a static state, but probably is either collapsing or expanding. Einstein never liked the cosmological constant. It makes the equations less beautiful. It's an arbitrary constant. It doesn't make them mathematically wrong, but it definitely takes away from the aesthetic appeal. So he happily renounced the constant when it was discovered that the universe is expanding. He was unhappy that he'd ever introduced it. 
So here he is, sad that he had ever introduced the concept. Now, I don't know that that's what Einstein is thinking, but he may well be thinking about this blunder of his. Well, what have we done the better part of a century later? We've rejuvenated the idea, not to give a static universe, but rather one which over the largest scales is accelerating, speeding up in its expansion. So here on Earth, the down arrow dominates. In our solar system, the down arrow dominates. In our galaxy, the down arrow dominates. In our cluster of galaxies, the down arrow dominates. But beyond our cluster, if you go out about 100 million light years, 200 million light years, this up arrow begins to dominate and space expands faster and faster and faster. So the concept of a repulsive effect of this sort, far from being Einstein's biggest blunder, may have been his greatest triumph. The concept of this kind of a repulsion. The only blunder was giving it the very unlikely, ad hoc, arbitrary, apparently arbitrary value that exactly matches the downward force of gravity. But that's just a small arithmetic thing, okay? The concept might have been brilliant. So again, I don't know what Einstein would really think or how he would react if he were around right now, but it may well be that his reaction would be kind of like what you saw on the cover of Science Magazine or perhaps here, you know? <laughs> that's maybe what his reaction would be. Now, the observations we initially published were based on supernovae three or four billion light years away. So all we could really say was that in the last three or four, maybe five billion, light year, billion years, the universe has been speeding up with time. If it's speeding up because of a weird property of space, a repulsive property of space, then there's a very clear prediction. The universe should have been slowing down long ago. And that's because long ago, galaxies were closer together, so their gravitational attraction for one another was stronger than it is now. Okay? As they spread apart, the gravitational attraction weakens. But as they spread apart, the repulsion strengthens because if the repulsion is a property of space, then the more space there is between two galaxies, the greater will be the repulsive effect. So in a sense, with time, gravity was decreasing in importance, and this anti-gravity, if you will, was increasing. Initially, gravity dominated. The universe slowed down in its expansion, but eventually it starts accelerating. That was a clear prediction. So we designed a project with the Hubble Space Telescope led by Adam Rees, my former postdoc. He was the principal investigator on this project. And we found and studied supernovae that were six, seven, even nine billion light years away. So we're looking at them as they were, six, seven, eight, nine billion years ago. And we found that indeed, the early universe was slowing down. In fact, it was slowing down for about the first nine billion years of its existence and only roughly five billion years ago did it start speeding up. So there was a transition from deceleration to acceleration. That's a change in the deceleration. Mathematically, it turns out that's known as a jerk. You know, there's position, then there's, you know, speed, then the change in speed is acceleration, and then the change in acceleration or deceleration is known as a jerk. So in a sense, we measured the cosmos to have gone through a jerk, a cosmic jerk. And the New York Times headline that came out was, a cosmic jerk that reversed the universe, and here's my former postdoc, Adam Rees. <laughs> now, you know how it is with big, thick newspapers. You look at the pictures and you read the headlines. Who has time to read these newspapers from cover to cover? You only read the articles in which you're most interested. Otherwise, you just glance at things. So I start getting all these phone calls. Hey, who's this jerk you work with who reversed the expansion of the universe? And anyway, this is also not the best picture of Adam. His mother wasn't pleased by this juxtaposition. But. So what is the stuff that has been causing the acceleration over the past four or five billion years? Is it the visible matter in the universe, the matter of the stars and galaxies? No, because all visible matter that we know of pulls. Okay, that's the property of normal matter. How about dark matter? How many of you have heard of dark matter? Okay, many of you have heard of dark matter. Yeah, dark matter, you can see it in this cluster of galaxies. You can see it there, 
there, there, there. There's dark matter. No, seriously, it's there. I'm joking that I'm pointing to it, but it is there, and we know it's there because this cluster of galaxies and others like it are gravitationally bound. We can tell they're bound. They're, there's too many clusters for them to be just chance passings of galaxies through the night. So they're gravitationally bound, and the speeds of the galaxies indicate how much gravity is pulling them in, how much gravity there is, and it's way more than can be accounted for by the visible galaxies. And this argument was actually first made by one of my heroes, Fritz Zwicky at Caltech. He was a brilliant astrophysicist. The problem was that he was arrogant and abrasive. He rubbed his colleagues the wrong way. He didn't think much of their intellectual capacity. Indeed, I'd venture to guess that here he's showing us what he thinks of the typical brain size of his Caltech colleagues. Now, Caltech is a pretty brainy place, and I'm sure the people there did not appreciate his opinion of them. Now, again, I don't know that that's what he's thinking, but it could be, you know. Zwicky is on record as having referred to his colleagues as spherical bastards, because, you know, they're bastards any way you look at them. <laughs> this is not a good way to make or retain friends, okay? Anyway, Zwicky came up with the concept of dark matter. I couldn't resist telling that story. But the dark matter clearly is not what we're looking for here. The dark matter is a big mystery. We don't know exactly what it is. It's one of the great mysteries of modern astro astrophysics. But it's not responsible for the acceleration of the universe. Indeed, if anything, it's a greater attractive gravity than you would have surmised based on the visible galaxies alone. So this really has to be something new, and, it, and it's not antimatter, by the way, because antimatter has attractive galaxy as well, uh, attractive gravity as well. So it's got to be something new. And for better or worse, the term that has stuck, it was coined by Michael Turner of the University of Chicago, is dark energy. This is to some degree regrettable because if there's one equation that a lot of people have heard of on the street, what's that equation? E equals mc squared. So I'm continually asked, is dark energy, in a sense, the same thing as dark matter? No, 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 dark matter pulls, dark energy pushes. They're really very different. They're different aspects of gravity. So don't just equate dark energy with dark matter, okay? They're, they're really very, very different. And we don't know what the dark energy is, but in honor of dark energy, my wife came up with this particular license plate. Can anyone figure it out? Oh, you got it. Dark, dark in RG, dark energy, dark in RG, and the accelerating universe. So uh, anyway, um, one of our graduate students has uh, has a license plate dark NRG, and I told my wife that's been taken. She says, oh, that's too obvious. She didn't want one that was so obvious. She wanted a subtle one for my car. So anyway, dark energy and the accelerating universe. So we don't know what it is. And you might say it's pretty weird, you know, this the repulsive stuff. How do you know your technique isn't flawed? Okay, now many teams are getting the same result using supernovae, but what if there's some flaw with the use of supernovae? Could be. In science, it's very important to verify conclusions with a number of independent methods. Only then do you gain real confidence that the conclusion is right. So the supernovae were the first method, but since then, there have been many others, and they show that the dark energy is either present or something I hadn't mentioned before, Einstein's general theory of relativity may be wrong on large scales. That's another alternative, but either one, dark energy or a failure of general relativity, it's pretty revolutionary, okay? And I don't have much time left, so let me just briefly say that snapshots of the universe when it was an infant, 380,000 years old, reveal tiny fluctuations in the temperature and hence the density of matter. And we actually know how big these fluctuations really should have been in physical scale and we can measure their angular size, and then you do some hocus-pocus with general relativity, and it tells you how much matter and stuff in general, matter plus energy, there must be. And there's way more than what can be accounted for just from normal visible matter and dark matter. Those add up to only about 27%. There's gotta be another 73% that's something else, consistent with the 73% dark energy that we found from supernova studies. Also, 
There's this large-scale structure in the universe, galaxies and clusters of galaxies and superclusters and voids. This is a computer simulation, but it looks much like our real universe. Where did all this structure come from? It came from these tiny little fluctuations in density, imprints from the early universe, which then grew with time under the action of both gravity and eventually anti-gravity. And when you run computer simulations of the growth of large-scale structure, you find that over billions of years, the structure that emerges in the computer matches what we see better if we include dark energy or a failure of general relativity than if we do not. So there, and there are a number of other techniques as well that are pointing to the same result. So a brief 12 years after the announcements of the discovery, this is now the standard model, a universe filled with mostly dark energy, partly dark matter, and a little bit of us. And we don't know how this happened. This is not your grandfather's universe, but it's now the standard model. 73% dark energy, 23% dark matter, 4% atoms, of which only 0.4% are easily visible in the form of stars and clouds of gas. We like to say that we're the debris of the universe, the afterthought of creation. That's not to say you're not important. You are to your friends and family, your loved ones. But you're not made of the dominant stuff of the universe. The dominant stuff of the universe is first and foremost dark energy. We don't know what it is. There are thousands of ideas. And secondly, dark matter. We think we know what it is. Wimps, weakly interacting massive particles, but we're by no means sure. And we don't know which wimps, if they really are wimps. So 96% of the universe is still a mystery to us. It behooves us to understand this. Moreover, it's thought that the dark energy may be one of the few observational clues to the long-desired quantum theory of gravity. You know, quantum mechanics works well with small masses on small scales, and general relativity works well with large masses over large scales, but if you try to put a large mass in a small volume, like the singularity in the middle of a black hole, the two theories are at war with one another. And one of the goals of string theory is to try to give a self-consistent quantum theory of gravity. But we do not yet know whether string theory is correct, any of the thousands of possible string and M theories. We, we just don't know. They may be correct, but we don't know which one, and maybe what emerges will be something completely different. But in any case, 
This is a, an energy thought to be related to quantum fluctuations of the vacuum itself or related to a type of particle that should be explainable in any grand unified theory of, of everything, okay? So finally, how will the universe end? Well, the reason there wasn't a question mark here initially was we figured the universe is accelerating right now. Not only does it not have enough matter to ever bring it back, but it's got this repulsive stuff that's making it expand faster and faster and faster with time, a runaway universe. So if you want to see galaxies or clusters of galaxies with your very own eyes through a telescope, you'd better look pretty soon in the next few tens of billions of years because beyond that time, they will have been whisked away to such great distances that we'll not be able to see them, even with the most powerful telescopes. So we thought the universe would expand forever. However, theorists pointed out that since we do not know what the dark energy is, it's conceivable that its sign will reverse in the future from one of gravitational repulsion to one of attraction. And in that case, if there's enough of the dark energy, it could ultimately make the universe stop and then recollapse once the dark energy becomes a gravitationally attractive type of energy. And there's even a historical precedent for this. We think the universe became very big early on due to a type of weird energy that caused accelerated exponential expansion. And then that energy turned into more or less normal stuff, the stuff of which Portland is made, okay? And that then exerts a normal attractive gravity. So in a sense, there's a historical precedent. So in that case, maybe the universe will someday recollapse. We just don't know. But the, met, the, the wise betting man right now would say that it'll expand either forever or for an extremely long time. Nevertheless, it might recollapse. And although Frost probably didn't know about anti-gravity and dark energy, he did know about these two possibilities. A recollapse, becoming hot, dense, compressed, sort of an ending in fire because it's hot. Or eternal expansion, becoming ever darker, more dilute, ever colder as the universe expands. He had this famous poem, right? Fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. So Frost would prefer the recollapsing universe and ending in fire. But if the universe and he have to perish twice, then eternal expansion and an ending in ice would be okay with, with him. And that's perhaps appropriate given his name, Robert Frost. <laughs> so thank you very much. I hope there's time for questions. I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. I, I wonder, what is your take on Steinhardt and Turek's ekpyrotic model? Yeah, what is my take on Steinhardt and Turek's ekpyrotic model, the so-called cyclic model of the universe? They uh, postulate that the Big Bang was actually the collision between two essentially parallel membranes, brains, okay, B-R-A-N-E-S. We think that our universe may be a membrane embedded in a higher dimensional bulk. And if you have colliding membranes, they could indeed release a lot of energy and cause effectively an expansion much like the Big Bang. It's an interesting idea. The problem I have with it is that they need some way of setting up all these membranes. They're trying to avoid Guth and Linde's inflation model, which makes the universe big due to this accelerated expansion when it was a blink of an eye old, okay? They're trying to avoid that, yet they need to somehow postulate the existence of these membranes. And so I find the hypothesis somewhat incomplete and not as uh, attractive, aesthetically attractive, as say a quantum fluctuation, either in some pre-existing universe or maybe in some 
uh, theoretical higher dimensional hyperspace, the quantum fluctuation occurs and then it grows due to inflation and makes the universe essentially for free. That's my preference. To their credit, they have a testable hypothesis. Inflationary theories predict that when gravitational wave detectors become sufficiently advanced, we will detect primordial gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time imprinted upon the universe when the universe was inflating. And if there are no such detections of gravitational waves, primordial gravitational waves, it will be an argument for the Steinhardt model. So, uh, good question. Why don't I just uh, alternate? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, I, oh, there's I one up above. Okay, so I'll go in a triangle. Oh, is it me next? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, I read in Scientific American or something, uh, which said the distribution of dark energy was uniform. Does this sort of uh, lend more credibility to one of the theories about dark energy or Yeah, so the distribution another? of dark energy as best we've measured so far is uniform, although I must, must say that we haven't measured it in great detail over many, many directions. So it's only to a good first approximation uniform. Does that imply anything specific about the theories? Not much, because both quantum fluctuations of the vacuum, um, in a sense the quintessential dark energy, the cosmological constant, or the alternative hypotheses, which actually are known as quintessence, so I shouldn't have called the first one quintessential, that was perhaps confusing, but the other theories go under the general umbrella of quintessence models, sort of like the Aristotelian fifth essence, you know, earth, air, fire, and water, and the, the stuff of the firmament. Anyway, all of those theories um, suggest a uniform or nearly uniform distribution. So they don't really, the, the, the observed uniform distribution doesn't give many important constraints. What it does tell us is that it doesn't clump up the way dark matter does. And so we can rule out some broad models, but those models weren't taken very seriously anyway. Right, right up there. Okay, so the, uh, the cosmological constant uh, is constant throughout space, and it uh, is said to actually cause more space to come into existence. Yeah. So how, does that, how is that reconciled with the conservation of energy? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Could everyone hear that? How does the accelerated expansion of the universe, either during inflation long ago or even now, how does that satisfy conservation of energy when it looks like you have more and more stuff in an ever bigger universe? That's an interesting question. It turns out that the dark energy, both the current dark energy and the stuff that inflated the universe long ago, has an interesting property. It has what's called negative pressure, and the negative pressure is what inflates the universe. But it also has a normal positive gravitational component as well. And just as with an apple dropped here from rest, just as an apple picks up kinetic energy, apparently for free, but not really, where's that kinetic energy, the energy of motion coming from? It's from, coming from a more and more negative gravitational potential energy. So it starts with zero of both, kinetic and potential, let's call it zero, and then it picks up one, two, three, four, five units of kinetic energy, but it also picks up negative one, two, three, four, five units of potential energy, because it's getting closer to the center of the Earth. So this is a process that conserves energy. The negative gravitational energy is ba balanced by the positive kinetic energy and the, and the mass energy. So in a similar way, the, the dark energy, be it the cosmological constant or really essentially any of the other presumed uh, possibilities, they have this property that, yes, they cause accelerated expansion, but there is a negative gravitational energy associated with this stuff as well. It just turns out that the pressure effect dominates the dynamics of the universe, causing it to accelerate in its expansion. But the gravitational effect is still negative, and you end up creating more and more of this stuff at exactly the rate at which the creation is balanced by the bigger and bigger negative amount of gravitational energy. So you get zero at all times. Alan Guth, one of the inventors of inflation, refers to the universe as the ultimate free lunch. Because if you just got it started a little bit with a quantum fluctuation, and it may have happened many times, and most of them just disappear, but if even one of them 
achieved conditions that were suitable for this inflation to take over, then the rest of the universe just grows into existence for free. And indeed, a flat universe, a geometrically flat universe, which is what the, the WMAP data seem to indicate, is indeed a, a universe with, with zero total energy. So our measurements suggest that the total en energy of the universe is zero or indistinguishable from zero, and inflation naturally comes up with that, and dark energy of the current sort would do the same thing as well. And that was a long answer because that was a very good question. Yes, right here. Uh, intuitively, uh, we all have a picture of the Big Bang and uh, all the expansions and the microwave background, isotropic, but you mentioned the possibility of an infinite universe. Could you, is it possible to make that intuitive? Yeah, it's hard to make an infinite universe intuitive because if we, especially if you think of the quantum fluctuation idea, it starts out and then it expands by some giant amount. It may inflate by many, many, many powers of two, okay, in a short time, but it's still, you would think, technically finite. I've asked my theorist buddies about this, and by the way, um, you know, I know which end of the telescope to look through. I'm not a card-carrying theorist. I'm an observer who gets data that hopefully gives observational constraints to the theorists. But, um, you know, so what they tell me is the following. Yeah, you know, at any given moment of time, if you could define some instant of cosmic time, no matter how big this balloon is, it's finite. If you take, if you're God and you make a, a constant slice of time. But the way time is practically defined in a universe is, in a sense, by the distance that light travels. And so if you define time that way as, as being basically, you know, different places are separated in time by how long it took for light to travel from one place to another, then you can define a, a, a region of constant time by watching the propagation of photons, of light signals through this universe. But if the universe itself is expanding, it turns out that you can't, you naturally come up with an, an infinite surface at a constant time. Now, I don't know if that's helping or, or hurting. It sort of hurts my brain a little bit. Um, I think it's their definition of time. And if you take sort of a godlike definition, then the universe remains finite. But that's maybe not necessarily the case. Theorists have no problems starting with an infinite universe. They don't know the origin then. You know, it's not necessarily a quantum fluctuation, but it just was, okay? If you just say that the universe was or is and is infinite, then, of course, there's no problem with an infinite universe. And it can even expand. There's no problem with something expanding if it's infinite. It just becomes less dense. The counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, are infinite. So are 10, 20, 30, 40. Those are infinite too. But in a sense, the counting numbers are more dense, although it's the same mathematical infinity. Or the rational fractions, one-third, one-half, two-fifths, thirteen-seventeenths, all the rational fractions, even between any two integers, those are infinite, and those are exactly the same size infinity as the counting numbers. They can be put into a mathematical one-to-one -one correspondence. So they're the same size infinity, but to me at least, the, you know, the, the rational fractions appear more dense than the counting numbers. So, you know, you can have an infinite universe. Just imagine this thing, and it expands, okay? Every little bit expands. You can make it expand just by having little mechanisms that make this thing expand, and it's finite here, and it expands, but you could easily make an infinite one of these things, and it'll expand. It just becomes less dense. So there's no mathematical problem with an infinite expanding universe. The greater problem is a conceptual one of origins. But I'm told by my theory buddies that it has to do with how time is defined. But again, this is a little bit above my pay raise. Okay, right there. I mean, my pay, my pay grade is what I meant. In the, University, in the University of California, we've needed a pay raise for many years now. Okay, but I should say it's above my pay grade. Yes. Thank you for a very illuminating talk. Thank you. You refer to today's election. 
um, I had to think about should we continue funding for transportation for the disabled, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I know a company that makes its money from deep, deep space exploration. As the U.S. economy crisis continues, um, how do we think about deep space exploration? Yeah. Let me ask the question at two levels. The first one is, what is our goal? Is right. it a philosophical, intellectual, existential goal, or is yeah. it a utilitarian goal? Because one day we might need a new planet to live on. Sure. And on the second level, once we decide it is viable, how do we decide how much to how allocate much to yeah. against all the competing social yeah, needs? Yeah, excellent question. There are many social ills, many things that are crying out for funding. So I, I have many answers to this. I'll try to keep it short because there's so many questions still there and I, I love this audience and I'm willing to stay, by the way, as long as you guys will let me, but uh, um, I'm not tired at all. So, <laughs> no, really, really. Uh, uh, yeah, no, we have a dinner, but, but hopefully we can do a few more questions. Anyway, Terry was worried that I might keel over because um, I didn't get much sleep last night, but that's my normal mode of existence. So, very good question. Um, at the fundamental level, we do this kind of stuff just because we want to know and of all living creatures on Earth, we think that we're the only ones that have the capacity to ask these questions and go about answering them. And so in a sense, if some small fraction of the GDP were not devoted to these kinds of studies, we would be selling ourselves short as humans. And I feel very privileged to be in a position with a roof over my head and you know, my next meal is pretty much certain. Um, I, I feel very privileged to be able to do this whereas much of the world is not in that situation. But from a more practical perspective, um, there are a number of important reasons that peer research of this sort should be done. First of all, you never know what spin-offs there will be in the future. And the example I like to give is the quantum physicists of a century ago. Heisenberg and Bohr and Einstein and Planck and Schrodinger had not the slightest practical application in mind in the early part of the 20th century when they were trying to come to an understanding of how atoms work and how subatomic particles work and you know, um, the nature of the electron and all that kind of stuff. Yet who can imagine today's world a century later without quantum physics? You may not know this, but much of modern technology, quantum electronics, lasers, you name it, it's based on quantum physics, okay? Or Newton, he was just trying to understand gravity and he invented the calculus and the laws of motion and all this stuff Countless applications now in today's world. A friend of mine, Charlie Towns, invented the laser. He tells me that if he had requested a penny from every product that was ever sold thereafter based on the laser, he would be the richest man in the world right now, okay? But he didn't. He thought it would have only slight practical applications in some esoteric, um, you know, fields. So you can't anticipate the spin-offs in the future. And then next, the social issue. First of all, people are intrinsically inquisitive. I talk to crowds all over the country, all over the world indeed, and, and everywhere. They want to know. We have the capacity to know. People want to know. They're intellectually stimulated. They're titillated by this kind of stuff. They're proud that humans have come to these intellectual achievements. And kids love this stuff. They get roped in by astrophysics. Most of them do not become astrophysicists, that's good. Some of them do, that's good too. But most of them get turned on by science and technology, often through astronomy and astrophysics or other areas of, of fundamental research. That hooks them in, they end up becoming applied physicists, engineers, computer specialists, and so on. And, you know, really, the great success of the US was in its technological growth ever since October 4th, 1957, the launch of Sputnik, the best thing that ever happened to US science and technology because the US government realized how far behind we were the Soviet Union. They started pouring large amounts of money into universities, stimulating research of this, much of which was applied, but the hook was initially largely of a fundamental nature um, of this sort. So I hope that answers your question adequately. Up there now. Now wait, are you the same fellow that just, no. you're, okay, good, because I want to give, yeah. yeah. Yes, go ahead. You mentioned that on large scale that one of the options is that the theory of general relativity doesn't hold in that case. 
are people consider seriously considering that, pursuing that? And if so, what are the yeah. formulations or variations? Yeah, so you know, instead of dark energy, it could be that general relativity is wrong on large scales, okay? Indeed, some people have proposed that even as an explanation, an alternative explanation for dark matter. It's not really that galaxies are moving around too fast in a cluster, it's that our understanding of gravity is wrong and it only looks like they're moving too fast, okay? But actually they're moving with the speeds they should be moving if our understanding of gravity were correct. So there have been a number of ideas. Um, I would characterize them as being, in general, largely confined to explaining one or two observations, but they don't have the generality of dark matter and dark energy explanations. Um, it's conceivable that general relativity is wrong in the following way. Maybe ours is one of many universes and we're like little bubbles in some bigger hyperspace and maybe the apparent acceleration is actually caused by the pull of all these other universes that are, quote, outside of ours, but still in this bigger hyperspace. That's something that general rel relativity in its normal form doesn't allow, right? When I was a kid, the joke was define universe and give three examples, right? The universe was all that there is, but now serious physicists are seriously considering other possible universes, and one possibility is that gravity actually can flow between these different universes, and so that might be what's causing this effect. And there are many other such things. I would say that more physicists are working now on possible explanations for dark energy and the nature of dark energy than failures of general relativity. But it could be that what we're seeing is a failure of general relativity, so we shouldn't ignore those possibilities. Yes? Um, uh, as I understand it, and there was the Big Bang, and there was a, an initial period of uh, super expansion, and then it settled down into That's normal That's exactly expansion. right, yeah. yeah. In fact, the Big Bang, the Bang was the period of super expansion. Okay. Okay. And now we're looking back into time with uh, looking at these supernovas and deciding that there is super expansion at the limits of what we can see. Yeah. Are we, we're looking back toward the Big Bang. Right. And we're seeing more expansion. Now, uh, the, the expansion was supposed to have happened in the first few fractions of a second, but yeah. are we seeing it maybe more yeah. over time? Yeah, yeah. So. So that's an interesting question, the, the behavior of the universe over time. So at t equals zero, none of us really knows what happened. Let's, let there be some little amount of matter, okay? A quantum fluctuation. Then there was this exponential growth, inflation, and that happened over the first, we think, trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, roughly 10 to the minus 35, 10 to the minus 36 seconds. So that's the launching of the apple. That's the acceleration of the apple. Then that dark energy, the, it's usually called the inflaton, it decayed into more or less normal stuff that's attractive. So that's when I let go of the apple. Okay, so I let go of the apple. That moment was when that dark energy turned into normal stuff. At that point, it, de it started decelerating the universe as the apple is doing on its upward journey. And it did that for nine billion years. And then five billion years ago, as the cumulative strength of the dark energy increased, Five billion years ago, the remaining dark energy, whether it's related to the original inflaton or something that's qualitatively similar but quantitatively something different, in any case, it began, its cumulative effect is now, or five billion years ago, started becoming dominant. And so now the universe is accelerating once again. It's not yet exponentiating, but as the universe expands, this um, pie chart changes the dark energy becomes a greater and greater fraction of the pi because the dark matter and normal matter just get diluted out. As the box with a thousand particles and it gets bigger, the density of particles goes down. That means the relative amount of dark energy goes up. So as the dark energy becomes closer and closer to 100% of the pi, we will enter an exponential expansion. We're not yet exponentiating 
were just accelerating. So in a sense, we're now entering a new bang, a modern day bang to the Big Bang. Well, you're putting, you're putting that into future, present and future tense. Shouldn't you be, wouldn't it be easier to understand if you put that into past tense? Well, the past is what we've observed, and I just described that for you. The future is what'll happen as the dark energy becomes progressively more dominant. So that's a prediction. Let me turn, because there's still more people. Uh, why don't I turn to the, well, oh, okay, I, last two questions, okay, I, yeah. I hope my question will connect with what you are talking about. We are talking about big bend. We yes. are talking about expansion. We are talking about time. Are we talking about eternity too? And if so, how would you talk about eternity? Eternity, well, as Woody, as Woody Allen said, eternity is an awfully long time, especially near the end. Uh, <laughs> So, if the universe expands forever, it will expand for all of eternity. If it recollapses, then in fact, it'll come to an end. Time, as we know, it will come to an end. And because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, we don't know what'll happen after that big crunch. We, our, our, our current laws of physics break down in the crunch, so we, we don't really know what'll happen. So eternity will only be reached if the universe expands forever. It's almost a tautology. But if it recollapses, then at least in the present day universe, time will come to an end, and I have no idea what will happen beyond the crunch. And then up there. Okay, well, taking into account both the set density of different elements and the set gravity of certain stars, um, let me see how to phrase this. <laughs> because, for example, our sun is very ordinary. Yeah. By being ordinary, that would also imply that it's probably one of the more common kinds of stars. And indeed it is. So, because the, <laughs> because the density of s different elements um, determines where planets form in a solar system. Yeah, that and temperature, by the way. And, and temperature, right. of course. Um, yeah. Would that imply that it is very, very likely that there would be extraterrestrial life because of how common yeah. our situation is? Yeah. So that's a very interesting question. Um, the first part is, how often are there planets around other stars, exoplanets? And that's a question where we're now gathering data. Over 500 exoplanets are now known, and there's a mission up there, the Kepler mission, which has many hundreds more candidates. Then the question is, how many of those are at the right distance from their star to have liquid water, at least for life as we know it? And let's just restrict our attention to that at first. Because, you know, if you go off to life as we don't know it, then anything sort of is possible and you don't know how to constrain your discussion. And then the question is, given habitable conditions, how often does life arise and, and develop, evolve into intelligent creatures such as ourselves? And there we have very little data. We have the example of Earth. And questions in biology are far more complex than questions in astronomy and physics. We deal with inanimate objects. The simplest cell is far more complex than any black hole, any galaxy, any cluster of galaxies that I could possibly have described. And the truth is we don't know how life arises and the details of how it evolves. Nevertheless, I'll give you my opinion. My opinion based on observations of life on Earth is that primitive life, by which I mean bacteria and uh, microbes, is probably pretty common out there because on Earth, primitive life formed shortly after the era of bombardment which marked the final stages of the creation of the Earth. You know, and there's evidence, there's chemical evidence for life 3.8 billion years ago and there's actual almost fossil-like evidence uh, 3.5 billion years ago. So that's really pretty far back. The era of heavy bombardment ended 3.9 billion years ago. So boom, life formed apparently, okay? However, um, 
the progression to intelligent life was very, very slow and convoluted. And indeed, there's been billions of species on Earth, even tens of billions over the course of its history. And as far as we can tell, we are the most intelligent and dexterous and all that, you know, that has ever been on Earth, okay? And we only appeared a short time ago, 160,000 years ago for Homo sapiens, four to five million years ago for the early hominids. So an intelligent alien looking at the Earth would have said that over most of its history, Earth did not have creatures like us. So we appear to be, by that score, pretty unlikely. And finally, it's not clear to me that intelligence and mechanical ability at our level presents a long-term evolutionary advantage. Over the short term, yes, life has improved for many people, most people, I would say, over the past couple of centuries. People are living longer, their health is better, the food sources are more reliable, et cetera, et cetera, because of technology and medicine. But our intelligence also gives us the possibility of destroying us and much of life on Earth. And we're the first living creatures that have that capability. So it's not clear we will survive in the long run because of our intelligence. So, you know, if life on Earth has followed the typical progression, my conclusion is that primitive life is common, slime and all those kinds of things, even simpler things, but that human-like things and above are very, very rare. But that's not to say that I know. This is my opinion. And I think we should keep searching for signals because if we don't search, we won't know. One final thing, just because um, I think there was a bit of confusion about this. It has nothing to do with your question, but if you'll permit me one minute. People often ask, what is the universe expanding into? And I didn't quite cover that question when I covered the infinite universe that's expanding. I meant to also mention a, a finite universe. Here's a two-dimensional hypothetical universe, this balloon. Let's say I constrain the laws of physics to only operate on the balloon, actually technically speaking in the rubber, but stickers on top will suffice. So I put a bunch of stickers. This is a two-dimensional surface. You can go forward or backward, left and right, or any combination of those two motions. But the laws of physics prevent you or a light signal or anything else that you know of from going into the balloon or out of the balloon. So all the stickers see the others moving away from them. They each think they're the unique center of the expansion. But n none of them is the unique center. However, is there a unique center? I can blow up this balloon. Not too much, otherwise I'll get a little bang. But I ask you, is there actually a unique center? Yes. Where is it? The center of the balloon. Right. Several people said that. But is that part of the physically accessible universe as I've defined it? No, because everything is constrained to be on the surface. Nevertheless, intelligent creatures could wander around and draw gigantic triangles and add up the sum of the interior angles uh, and figure out that it's more than 180 degrees, which is not the case on a sheet of paper that's flat. And they could go off in one direction and come back to the point from which they started. In other words, they could conclude they live on a spherical, positively curved surface. They could even write down an equation for their universe x squared plus y squared plus z squared is the square of the radius. Or in polar coordinates, r is just the radius, and then theta and phi take on all of their allowed values. Either way, that's an equation for, for their universe. They correctly deduce that it has a center in a mathematically definable but physically inaccessible dimension. x, y, z of zero, that's the origin. R of zero, theta and phi are undefined. That's the origin. They would correctly conclude that there are three spatial dimensions, but their two-dimensional surface wraps through an intrinsically three-dimensional hyperspace, at least mathematically. Okay? So if our universe is the three-dimensional counterpart of this, then our three-dimensional space, X, Y, Z, may wrap around a fourth spatial dimension, call it W. And uh, if we live in such a universe, the equation for our universe is x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus w squared, 
is the square of the radius. Now, I can't point to where W is. I'm not allowed to. The laws of physics don't allow me to. But mathematics is quite comfortable with this dimension. So you see, that's a finite universe wrapping through a higher dimensional mathematical space. Kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, thank you. Okay.